And as we come to look at the Word of God, you may like to follow along in your few Bibles. And you will find this reading taken from Mark's Gospel 10, 32 to 45, on page 1015, page 1015 of your Pew Bibles. And just again, it's Mark 10, 32 to 45. Let's say a word of prayer as we come to reflect on the Word together. Father God, we pray that your Word would dwell richly in our hearts. And that through the power of the Holy Spirit within us, it would blossom into ever more obedient faith, marked by deeds of love and service, so that through the Spirit's power, your church may be used for your purposes mightily here in Broomley's. And we offer this prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, it didn't take me long to learn as a dad that uh, agreeing to unspecified requests from my kids was a fairly dumb idea. A wise parent answers questions like, hey dad, can you do something for me? Or excuse me mum, can you help me? With a question of their own, usually along the lines of, tell me what you need first. <laughs> or my favorite reply to our boys is, it depends. A lot of what I say to them is, it depends. Usually it depends if I'm in the mood to do it. Plenty of tantrums have erupted from little children whose parents have blindly accepted the, the vague requests of their kids, but they have not, uh, back, then they have to back out and they get in all sorts of trouble when they don't want to go along with their children's true motivations. St. James and St. John, the sons of Zebedee, appear to be asking Jesus a kind of leading question in verse 35. Teacher, they say, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now there's a great deal of audacity pulsing beneath the surface of that question. It is a loaded request. Having all the knowledge and wisdom of the Godhead within him, Jesus isn't fooled into signing a blank, blank check by blindly agreeing to their question. He fires back with a question of his own. What do you want me to do for you? Our Lord was the master of asking searching questions to expose people's true motives. And we see him deploy this tactic again and again in all four Gospels. Of course, Christ doesn't ask these sorts of questions because he doesn't know. He has, this is the second person of the Trinity. He is Jehovah enrobed in human flesh. He literally knows everything there is to know. So when Jesus asks mere mortals these sorts of questions, it's for a strategic reason. Usually, he is leading them on the adventure of discovering the truth for themselves. Or... He is exposing their own error. This is one such an occasion where Jesus answers a question with another question in order to help James and John see the error and the folly of their request. They reply, without any hesitation or bashfulness, uh, we want to sit at your right and left hand in your glory. When reading and studying scripture, we must always strive to keep the wider context of the Bible in our minds. One of the risks of preaching from the lectionary week in and week out is that uh, each week we are separated by six days and we can come to see the Bible narratives as these sort of isolated little bubbles, especially when the lectionary jumps bits. Scripture always interprets scripture. So in the context of St. Mark's Gospel, the request from the Sons of Thunder is not only absurdly prideful, it's sinfully idiotic. So we see that James and John, uh, at the, sorry, we see in the beginning of our gospel lesson in verses 32 and 34, to, uh, that Jesus explicitly predicts perhaps the most obvious prediction of his own death. This time, the third time round, he's done that in St. Mark's gospel. Now you may recall a few weeks ago, I mentioned that chapter 8 is the turning point in the Mark and gospel narrative. From then onwards, Jesus moves towards his passion and death in Jerusalem with a sort of relentless march towards the cross. The previous two times the Lord had taught on his impending death, the disciples dramatically failed to grasp the significance and true meaning of what Jesus was teaching them. So following his first prediction, which we see in Mark 8, Peter tries to rebuke Jesus, dissuading him from the cross, only to be severely rebuked in return. This causes Jesus to launch into a teaching about the true nature of his coming kingdom. He informs the twelve apostles, whoever wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, 
and follow me. That's in Mark 8.34. And after his second prediction, the apostles burst into an argument over who will be the greatest in the kingdom of God, which prompts Jesus to teach them that if any man wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all, from Mark 9.35. So now after his third prediction of his death and his resurrection, some of his closest friends, some of his best friends, pridefully seek to gain power and dominance over their fellow apostles. Pride is a heinous sin. It's an insidious sort of trespass that can subtly and seductively lead even the best Christians to justify all sorts of other evils in our lives. We human beings are inclined towards hubris. A little success, and suddenly we find ourselves gloating. A touch of giftedness, and we easily, easily become self-obsessed. Quickly and with relative ease, human beings think that we are better than we really are. We imagine ourselves as being indispensable. It makes sense that pride would be the root of many other evils. After all, it was the first ever sin in the cosmos. Uh, the prophet Isaiah tells us in his book, chapter 14, verse 14, that Satan, who was once an angel of God, sought to pridefully usurp God's throne and take it for himself. And that was the same sin that the old snake tempted Eve and Adam with in the Garden of Eden, that if they defied their maker, they too would be as gods. Little wonder then that in our modern world, much of the rising tide of immorality in society marches under a rainbow-coloured banner of pride. But Jehovah warns us, although pride is familiar, it is strangely alluring. Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall, in Proverbs chapter 16. James and John had evidently not, not heeded the words of Solomon, and they show us that this treacherous sin can even infect gospel-believing, born-again believers. And we ought to be vigilant in our own hearts to rout out this sin, because it dangerously warps our proper view of God's kingdom, and it can do immense damage to our personal discipleship, and it can also harm other Christians. One of the best cures for pridefulness, though, is daily and dedicated prayer, and of course, the study of God's written word, the Bible. Now, the more we understand our human condition from the pages of the Bible and the glory of God as revealed through the uncompromising lens of Scripture, the more our priorities are set straight. For instance, our Old Testament lesson from the book of Job is a great example of a pride-killing passage. Through it, we join Job as God rebukes the patriarch, firmly putting him and us back in our place. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations, thunders Yahweh, as the maker of the universe hotly rebukes Job for daring to question the wisdom and motives of the Most High God? The Lord is effectively asking Job and us by extension, who do you think you are? Or as the psalmist put it, we humans are nothing more than dust and ashes compared to the eternal, changeless perfection of God. And yet human society, in its pride, constantly tries to rewrite God's laws, creating our own paradigms of morality. We frequently crush others to climb up ladders of success that are temporal and will only gain us scorn in eternity. For James and John, they receive a rebuke in the form of another question from the living word, the Lord Jesus, who asks them if they think they can drink the cup or be baptised in the way that he must be. These are metaphors for his suffering and death that he has repeatedly predicted to them. And he uses a similar language here that he will later deploy in his prayer to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he begs for the cup of suffering to be passed from him, if it is possible. But the apostolic brothers are so blinded by their pridefulness, by their desperate desire for status and power and dominance over others, that they, with reckless glee, answer Jesus, we can, we can, don't even hesitate. Perhaps they misunderstood the true meaning of Christ's question, but I think it's more likely that in their reckless pursuit of glory, they'd have agreed to just about anything. 
Nonetheless, Jesus then predicts that they too would indeed suffer and die for him and his kingdom, sharing in his sufferings. And the ancient church traditions tell us that James would spread Christianity all the way to Spain, only to return to Jerusalem to be martyred, killed by the sword for his bold faith in Jesus. And St. John would go on to be the only apostle to die a natural death of old age, writing the book of Revelation, along with the gospel and letters that bear his name. Even so, although he wasn't martyred, he too would suffer immensely for being a Christian and his faith in the Lord, being repeatedly beaten, tortured and tossed in prison. I think it's a divine irony that these fiery tempered brothers who demand Christ give them a place of glory in his kingdom, wanting cheap grace and a shortcut to splendor, are used by God in his great glory to humble them and become servants on the true path of God's glory, which is marked by suffering, humility and self-sacrifice. Like James and John, we must be cautious, very cautious, not to let our prideful ambitions or warped visions of what kingdom citizenship should look like get in the way of the path of bearing our cross and submitting ourselves to the will of God for his great glory and not for our own. For some Christians, the end always justifies the means. I've served long enough in churches over the last decade, first as a lay minister and then as a clergyman, to witness many saints who truly love Jesus, but tragically misplace their zeal into a sort of wickedness because they've been slowly twisted by pride and selfish ambition. We can justify all sorts of wicked actions when we're convinced that we are right or we know best. But Jesus won't have any such arrogance in his kingdom. It's not the way for the Christians. For those of us who follow the way, our Lord demands a relentless self-abasement and the mortification of our sins. As John Owen once wrote, the great Puritan writer, be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. It may seem that our lessons from St Mark's Gospel have been like a broken record the last month or so, repeatedly returning back to a similar theme, dragging us back again and again to learning about kingdom values versus our own sinful desires. And in a sense, that's actually just what God does through the Mark and Gospel making a point and then repeating it with more elaboration. And the general rule of thumb is when the theme is repeated, it must be very important. Also, I think because we Christians, like all other humans, are so inclined to wander off, God keeps drumming into us the vital importance of God-oriented, self-denying, other-serving, gospel-focused kingdom values. So back in our text, we see the sons of Zebedee didn't even respond to Christ's rebuking question. Perhaps they, like Peter after his rebuke, were left stunned and dumbfounded. I know I would be if the Son of God gave me a stern talking to. In verse 41, we see that the other apostles, though, had caught on, and they were suitably upset at the request that the brothers had made of Jesus. Even though they were quite justified in being cross about it, that doesn't mean it validates sinning over it. After all, Jesus says in the, sermon, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount that Christians must never strive for an eye for an eye. And so, as the apostles are beginning to grumble amongst themselves, Jesus steps in and he tries to reconcile a lot of them. But it's little wonder that the rest of the apostles were very angry because James and John already enjoyed a privileged position among the apostles with St. Peter in Christ's inner circle. These three men were his best friends, closest to Christ and privy to his most miraculous and private moments. It seems James and John wanted to cut Peter out of this friendship and elevate themselves above absolutely everyone else. One can't help but wonder if they had been granted this privilege, how long would it have taken for the two brothers to then turn on each other, fighting over who would have the right hand and the left hand at the side of Christ? In verse 42, Jesus sees how angry the apostles are uh, with the brothers, this could lead to division, and Jesus won't have any of that, so he brings them together to teach on kingdom citizenship yet again. This time the Lord deploys a slightly different tactic, and he gives them and us an example to avoid and an example to follow in order to strive for proper morals and conduct in his glorious kingdom. 
The kingdom of God here on earth is one of greatly unexpected realities. It turns the world upside down, but not in ways that people expect. Kingdom citizens are called to live lives that are so utterly countercultural to the values of the society around us and different to the world that it attracts others to us, that it causes people to question their own morality and seek after the Lord whom we serve. Now, Jesus is well aware that we will fail very frequently in this God-given mission. And the reason we fail is even though we're saved and born again, we are still sinful human beings. And we are given the Holy Spirit to assist us. Even so, we still mess up. And God's grace and God's forgiveness are part of the economy of the kingdom. An unlimited providence of mercy. And it's wonderful that we are not limited, that God's purposes are not limited by our weaknesses. So Jesus gives us a comparison with the unbelievers uh, to contrast to the values of the kingdom. The pagans, he says, lord it over others. They exercise a sort of unjust and unfair authority. Now, it was common for pagans in the first century to violently abuse their underlings, beating slaves and even killing those beneath them on the social hierarchy. In Greco-Roman culture, it was common to view anyone below your station as, below, as subhuman and disposable. Slaves were bought and sold as property. Gladiators were used to fight to the death purely for the entertainment of the affluent upper classes, and unwanted babies were literally tossed into sewers. Class systems, segregation, and mistreating others who are different to us is always a vile evil. Beating, whipping, and abusing subordinates was par for the course in almost all pagan societies. But Jesus dramatically compares this to the Christian way. Not so with you, says the Lord. Not so with you. That ought to be our little motto, a mantra, if you will, for every time our wickedly sinful hearts draw us towards in, uh, disobedience, mistreating our fellow believers, holding grudges, lording it over our brothers and sisters, pridefully uh, indulging our ego, we ought to pause before we sin and reject God's authority and say to ourselves, not so with you. Jesus is clear. Any Christian that aspires to lead, any Christian that wants to be great in his kingdom, must walk the path to that goal by becoming a servant of their fellow believers. Now that's a total reversal of our natural sinful inclinations. It turns the power structures of godless culture on their head. We may not live in pagan Rome anymore, but we do live in neo-pagan Britain, where the gods of consumerism selfish ego and unbridled greed call us to crush anyone who gets in the way of our self-advancement and ascendancy. Not so with you, says Jesus, in his countercultural, world-changing, life-shaking kingdom. If you want to rise to the top in God's kingdom, make sure you constantly keep yourself firmly at the bottom. If we are to avoid the negative example of the heathens, then Jesus offers us a positive example. In verse 45, he lovingly extends to us the ultimate goal to strive for in discipleship and kingdom moving. And his example is himself. If this radical sort of kingdom living is good enough for the Son of God, then it's good enough for his disciples. The founder of the kingdom is the best possible example of how to live in the kingdom. After all, it's his kingdom. The all-powerful, all-knowing, almighty God did not abandon humanity to obliteration for our sins, nor did he come to earth to save us through violent revolutions or conquests. The only one who is truly worthy of all praise and honour and glory humbled himself to become a human being, to die for our sins, and to rise again for the eternal salvation of billions of undeserving wretched sinners who, would not, who really truly deserve nothing less than hellfire for all eternity. If ever there's been someone who had the right to lord it over other people, it's Jesus Christ, God incarnate. And yet that's not what he did. That is not the way of Christ. Unfair, unjust dominance is not the domain of the Prince of Peace. He rules with love, justice, and mercy, dying in our place 
and opening up the only path for all humans who truly believe in him to be saved. He is, as the author of the Hebrews says, the author and perfecter of our faith, our great high priest, and the greatest shining example of what kingdom values should look like. Jesus calls us to a vastly different ethic than the one the world around us holds so dear. He invites us to follow his divine example of radical humility, obedience to God, and self-giving. In Christ we see that God honours service and self-sacrifice over power plays and self-aggrandising. In God's kingdom, the, the world is turned truly upside down. And even though the kingdom is not fully realised in this world, the light and power of that self-sacrificial living glows brightly in the darkness of the earth's collapsing and sinful cultures. Jesus challenges, challenges us that we ought to live by the morals and values of the kingdom here and now. But it's a tough way to live. There's no denying it's a tough way to live. And it's a discipline that the church in many parts in the 21st century has lost. We must constantly reapply ourselves to being dedicated to the kingdom values of serving others and putting them first. Every clergyman and every congregation member at one point or another is tempted to put self-advancement above the needs of others, to reach for titles, to grasp for status, to ignore God's commandments, to lust after power, control and glory at the expense of others. But Christ commands us to resist these evil temptations and to fix our eyes firmly upon him as the ultimate example of Christian living. Of course, Jesus models sacrifice and service for us in a way that we can never achieve by uh, sacrificing himself on the cross and atoning for our sins and rising again. But therefore, that means the Messiah is the one who truly deserves our worship and dedication. One of the best ways we can show our love for our Saviour and our Lord is to obey him, to submit to his commandments and to do what he asks of us. My constant prayer is that we at St David's may always be a church family that stands out from the world around us here in Broomleys, not through stepping on others to gain prominence or selfish ambition, but rather through emulating Christ our Lord by displaying his power to the unbelievers around us in our weakness and meekness, in our deeds of humble service, gracious love and gentle faith expressed both in word and in deed. And if we do that, I think the Lord will continue to bless us and add to our number. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.